2012, just a couple of months ago, right? I remember when he was in my head, 406 course. And, and I remember at that time, he was really just, I mean, he stood out because he brought a passion, he brought an energy, he brought an enthusiasm to how he felt and what he thought about education. And that's what we encourage each and every one of you all to do, is to bring a passion, bring a commitment, and bring an enthusiasm to why this work matters to you. Aldrich is a phenomenal uh, young man who's been involved in uh, the Filipino community in his hometown of Stockton, California. Uh, he has earned, he earned his BA from San Francisco State University. We have anybody from San Francisco? Woo woo! Also, this is a testimony to the kind of young man he is. Not only did he earn his secondary social science credential, but now he's in the process of earning his multiple subject credentials. So he will cover not only the, the secondary level, but also the, the elementary level, because he understands the usefulness of trying to reach young people at all levels. Uh, he is a connoisseur of hip-hop music. Uh, he is a connoisseur of how we incorporate uh, sort of pop culture into how we think about teaching and learning. Uh, so, and he was also uh, 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 the commencement speaker in June uh, for uh, our program. And uh, the kind of response that we have gotten from people who were there was just phenomenal. So you were truly in for uh, uh, a treat. So if you will, would you please give me, uh, join with me and give me a, a warm welcome for all the I have a voice. If not, I refill it uh, with margaritas and I relax. <laughs> uh, so, first off, um, congratulations for being here. I know for many of you, it's been a long journey to get through these steps. You know, to be you don't just become you don't just decide I want to become a teacher. It takes a lot of thought, a lot of reflection, um, and a lot of discussion with your mentors, with your your community. So, congratulations, congratulations again to you for being here. Um, give it up for yourself. I still can't believe I was just here two, uh, about two, two years ago. Um, so, where you're at now, I just want to say it's it's going to be really exciting. Um, you're going to feel a lot of support, a lot of love, and you and everyone around you will definitely you know transform throughout the years. So, um, I have re a lot of excitement for you. Um, I'm starting teaching finally, and but if I could come back here and do it again, you know that would be great. But enjoy this time, treasure all the moments you're gonna have. Um, it's gonna be cool. So, myself as a teacher, um, prior to wanting to teach, I uh, I wanted to be a performer, and in, in many ways I still am. I still work on music. Um, I've had experience directing shows. Uh, so when I like to uh, meet a new group of people. And introduce myself. Um, I like to share a piece, and I wrote a piece um, basically about we all come from different communities, and as community members, as products of these communities, we must understand that we are responsible if the community isn't operating properly. That we need to gain, grow, go together in solidarity and work with each other to see an end to crime, to fix education, to do all these different things. So I wrote this piece about my own hometown in Stockton, California. I'm from Southside, Stockton, California, born and raised. Um, later on, I'm going to share, share with you uh, my experiences and basically how I got here at TEP and how I'm doing now after um, the program and now teaching. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to do a call and response. Um, so I'll signal you. I will say uh, it's about Stockton, but you know, pretend it's about your own city, wherever you're from. Uh, I'm going to say, whose city is this? And you're going to say, the city is ours, three times. Okay, so let's practice that. Whose city is this? The city is ours. The city is ours. The city is ours. All right, pretty good, teachers. Very good job. All right, so let's try this again. Oh, all right, we're, gonna, we're just going to do the actual thing now. Okay, so we'll uh, start it up. Whose city is this? The city is ours. The city is ours. The city is ours. Whose city is this? The city is ours. The city is ours. The city is ours. I'll walk 
my city smiling, but frowning at the crime in every single block, poor families grinding, flowers and candles on the floor, kids dying, peace to the life of Trayvon Martin, and all kids like him around my block, I think about y'all and I continue to walk, how it could have been me, though I got a degree, but these cops pulling triggers like bullets are free, and yo, I understand the mentality, you either leave Stockton or stay six feet deep, but y'all, the moon, the sun, and stars. Let me tell you one time, the city is ours. Let me tell you two times, the city is ours. And in case you ain't here, the city is ours. I could go on for bars and bars, but you need to remember, the city is ours. Whose city is this? The city is ours. The city is ours. The city is ours. And whose city is this? The city is ours. The city is ours. The city is ours. Now political puppets or white supremacists Corporate capitalists all trying to kill us, but you and me, the community, we need to rise up and set our people free. Go get a degree or get organized. Tell that 1% that you're sick of the lies. The work ain't about just trying to get by, but to get these bullets out of the sky. It's so easy to leave, say peace and bye, but that brain drain really ain't done to fly. That's just a band-aid fix to a systemic problem. You need to get back if you're trying to solve them. I take a left and I continue to Walk. My name is Alder Sabak. I am from the stock, a city of hope, a city of dreams, and in my city I always believe. Whose city is this? The city is ours. The city is ours. The city is ours. Louder, whose city is this? The city is ours. 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 Thank you for engaging with me. <laughs>
in which we got to work with students of color, um, especially Filipino American students, and allow us to provide a counter narrative for the students. Um, so my mentor there shot me straight to TP. I uh, came here, applied a lot of programs, but they all made me promise I would end up here, and I did, and it was definitely one of the best decisions I could have ever made in my life. So I came out to TP. Um, while here, I did some work teaching a little bit at Echo Park. Um, I did my student teaching at Markham Middle School primarily and, uh, in Watts. And now I am at Teen Charter School. I, uh, I got a, a history, a social science credential. Um, while I was here, I was, I was also able to add on the English authorization. So I technically, I guess I have two credentials. Um, but now I'm currently getting a multiple subject credential and I took up I took up a fourth grade teaching job. So it's really cool. I really see my fourth graders as middle school students. Um, I'm really excited to be back with the younger ones. Um, it's been really exciting. So slowly I'm gonna share with you more of what I've been doing this far and how TP has helped shape that and help has allowed me um, to basically be a better resource for my own community. So uh, this is my cohort. I uh, was part of the team lead. Right here, from my novice year. Um, this was my other cohort, Team Darby, right over here. Nice. Two phenomenal, amazing groups of people that really uh, became my family. So while you are here, some of these folks, you don't know, some of y'all might get married, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but these folks are my friends, you know, like, a lot of them I came in, they knew I was flying in, like, what, you're here? Pick me up, midnight. Let's get drinks. We're good. We're gonna hang out. <laughs> we need to decompress. Um, but we got to check in. So, you know, these folks here, a lot of them will be with you for the rest of your lives. So appreciate each other. Um, they're gonna be your support the next two years. Support for as long as you're a teacher and you know your community. So I want to go back to purpose. And I really want to talk about purpose because it's my purpose for me was my drive. I left my city, you know, not a lot of people will do this, but I was slowly seeing, you know, it's like when you leave a space, you don't know how the rest of the world, uh, how the rest of the world is until you're out of the space, your little, I guess, bubble. So for me, you know, I grew up in a low-income community. Uh, there's a lot of crime. So, you know, I thought like high schools were always like that. I thought communities were always like that. Nobody ducks in the shootings, I don't know. Um, so I was in San Francisco, and I, you know, um, I left, and I promised the mentors I had there that I would do, I never knew what it was, but I would do something to eventually come back and be a resource for my community, to serve my community. So I had no idea how that would be. Um, it was just that one ethnic studies class that eventually pushed me towards education. For me, I really saw, saw that my experience as a performing artist um, was really useful in education. I really love doing a lot of physical and engaging and fun and visual activities with my students. Um, so that's, that's, that's you know, really important for my purpose. So I think about purpose, I think about what Socrates says in that the unexamined life is not worth living. We all have different reasons for being here. Some of us are from different communities. Some of us are from LA. Uh, we want to be a, the biggest resource we can be for all parts of LA. So it's important for us to examine who we are, why we are here. And next, I think about what Malcolm Max said in that the examined life is painful. It's hard to be clear and true to your purpose. Um, it was really difficult for me to leave San Francisco after five years of going there to leave LA. I, I built community here, you know. I got attached to my students in this community. It's really difficult, but I made a promise to myself and as much as I wanted to be also a resource for students and youth and communities in, in Los Angeles, I knew that my community in Stockton, California really needed me. So I'm from Stockton. Stockton right now, we are in crisis. That's what I'm defining it as at this very moment. Uh, all kinds of things are going on. So I'd like to share a little bit. Uh, within recent years, we are always on Forbes' list of something really bad. Um, no. So, miserable cities list. We're constantly within the top 10. Apparently, we're at 11 now. 
I don't know why it got any better. Um, <laughs> so we're constantly top ten. We've a lot of times been uh, we've been number one for three years, the last five, seven years, something like that. Um, our violent crime rate went really high, according to some research that I should verify myself. Um, our we're, stop, we're number two uh, to open California at the moment. Um, we're going really, really high. I'll share more about that and how it's going. Um, the way the city is managed and education is really poor. There's a, I found this article while I was putting this together, and it was basically about how we were considering putting a second Walmart. You know, this was way back then. But right before I left, we just opened the third Walmart, and uh, it's taking our jobs, closing community businesses. It's not like, you know, in L.A., and when recently in Chinatown, they're really protesting to get the Walmart out of there. It's really different for us right now. People aren't seeing the, what they're doing to our communities. Um, Yahoo Finance put it says one of the ter 10 worst places to find a job. So one reason, though I, I really was hoping to go back into elementary at some point, happened sooner than I expected, um, this was the first job that came up for me in Stockton. After a whole, I don't know how many months of trying, and it's because I got the homie hookup. Uh, my friend got me a job. So it was just weird. It just worked out. So uh, I, was trying, I was trying to get a job in Oakland, in Sacramento. Um, I was going to stop for a little while, but somehow it worked out. Um, ten more cities to live, according to Aryan Vibes. So it's, it's a lot of different things. Um, we recently went into bankruptcy. Yeah, so we, and I, and I apologize when I'm joking about it, even though it's a serious issue for us. And, we're trying to, you know, make light of the situation um, that <coughs> the uh, largest city um, to go bankrupt next to us in Vallejo. Um, so it's affected the city in a lot of different ways. A lot of public spaces have been, um, go have gone to the banks. Bank of America, Wells Fargo. This is also um, in relation to how foreclosures have worked. It's, it's amazing how, and I had a discussion with this with my students, like, it's crazy how there's so much homeless people around the city, yet there are so many available homes, but these, the banks are holding on to them and foreclosing people, and it's, it's horrible, it's sad, and it's depressing. Um, crime is going crazy. I, uh, you know, I grew up, you hear stuff here and there, you see things. This is the first time in my life where probably five days out of the week, I will hear five to ten shots a night. If it gets any worse than that, sometimes one night out of ten, uh, 20, there are a lot of gang shootouts going on, a lot of different things go happening. So I hear things every night. One thing that scares me is, I, I, uh, I, you know, I never know sometimes things might happen. I don't know if my students want me to sub after. So it's, really, it's a really scary situation for us at the moment. Um, I live by the Stockton Flea Market. They've been um, throwing bodies just two blocks away from my house. So there's like, in my piece, I was talking about flowers and candles on the ground. There's been a lot of that everywhere. So let's talk more about that. Um, men shot outside the shoe store. It was a Payless shoe store right next to my house. Um, there's been several cases where there's been shootings every day. And we laid off a lot of police officers. I'm not sure if they, some of them came back on. So police officers have gone down the number. Um, we can't afford to pay them. We have police officers on bicycles instead of cars. Um, and it's been happening to several, and, and they can't be everywhere at the same time. And I've even asked the police officers, I asked the chief of police when I first met him, um, so what do you do if there's a shortage? And he was like, well, there may be moments in which we will say we can't make it. And it's a really difficult thing to do that. Um, a man shot and killed in a miracle mile. It's a more, I want to say, you know, middle and upper class part of the city. Um, person was shot. I was actually doing photography about an hour right before this happened. I left to go somewhere, and apparently um, someone, my friends, and he was murdered. Um, so let's keep keeping going. Straw shootings, 10 year olds raised by bullets. Um, this right here is my friend Mike. I grew up with him. He lives uh, in an apartment complex. A two-year-old was murdered and shot uh, next, to, next to his own complex, right with his neighbor. Um, woman slain in a trailer park, um, a lot of different things. Uh, last year, we broke our record for homicides. We hit 56 
all the way until like the day or two, a day or two before New Year's. Um, which is really devastating. This year, it's September, we are at 49. This person was a friend of this, another person I knew. Um, he was uh, killed in broad daylight for his gold chain. He was just taking a walk in the park. It wasn't even a really, quote unquote, unsafe part of town. Um, and it was actually, it happened right from the fire station. So it's getting to the point where people are getting so desperate, you know, um, in broad daylight, they will do what they need to do to survive, to eat. Um, and it's something I, I talk to my students about. I'll mention more later. Um, but this is where we're at. We're basically on track to double what we did last year and really push that record further. So, you know, I wanted to share this, not to be all depressing, but, you know, for me, this is my, this is my truth. This is my city. This is where I need to be. This is where I take every single thing I gained from TEP to use and make a difference here. From every class you take, from every experience in student teaching, I am taking everything I can and doing what I can in that classroom, outside of the classroom, to change it up for my students, to tell them that they, that this is their city, they need to be the change. They gotta do it. So, so you know, I had to be committed to this purpose. It was really hard. It's hard not to find a job, to live in a community when you're not sure something may happen, it's really scary. I told myself the one thing that I would do my best in is that when I would move home, I would stay in that community. I wouldn't move. Um, my mom helped me out. She turned my garage into a studio, so I'd stay there now. It was pretty cool. Um, Saving money on rent, that's a good one. Pay on off loans. Uh, so, uh, so commitment. And when I think about commitment, I think about, uh, first off, what um, Dr. Patrick Kamayangian says. He once told me that um, we need to read, write, and think as if our lives depended on it. Dr. Patrick Kamangian, uh, also alumni of UCLA, came from uh, urban schooling, now a professor um, at University of San Francisco. And he was saying in a presentation I was with him that, that when which I saw him that, you know, we really need to tell our students and also as our, ourselves as teachers, we need to read, write, and think as if our lives depend on it. This isn't just for good grades, this isn't just for whatever kind of academia prestige. It's really like life or death for us. You know, when he was telling me this, and he was sharing his experience teaching in Crenshaw, and that that's how he was teaching. He's really getting, making sure his students are realizing that it's not just to go to college, not to do this. We're trying to survive out here. And then I think about what Tupac says in that, I'm not saying we're gonna change the world, but I guarantee that it will spark the brain that will. And I think about that because, you know, I'm never sure if I'm doing the right things, but when I'm with my students, they are my hope that one of them, or all of them, actually, they're gonna be this change. And the best thing I can do for this city right now is to support them, to not get sick, to be there every day. I'm gone today, but I'm gonna bring them a lot of pencils tomorrow <laughs> to work out. Uh, so, Okay. Um, so right now I'm teaching, I teach as if my life, my student, my students' lives, and my community's livelihood depends on it. Because I know my students will heal the city. I truly believe that. You know, people would tell me that when I was still a student teacher and everything. And you know, as you're in the program, you, you, you're definitely going to be inspired in many ways. But there are certain things you will finally see when you are in that classroom with your students, you know, in that community, in that space, things just start appearing like, it's, it's, a, it's amazing, it's a beautiful experience, it's tiring, I'm pretty sure I lost like 10, 20 pounds since I've been teaching, all this walking, um, make sure you eat lunch, don't skip lunch, uh, but this is where I'm at, I'm, uh, uh, I really believe this, like, I will put all my money on this, all my money in my students, this is where I'm, I'm putting it all in, because I know, they can do it, it'll be this change. And then, and hope. So, when I think of hope, I think of, I think that, you know, as you're teaching, while you're here, and Apollo Ferris says that without a minimal of hope, I may quote this wrong, we can only, we can barely start the struggle or something like that. Just look that up. We'll, we'll look. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyways, we'll figure that out there. But anyways, uh, hope is such 
it's not, you know, it's, it's such a big thing, you know. And you need hope. You need to believe that you are making a difference. You, you survive, as my mentor, Allison Tatiyanko Kubalas, will say. Um, as teachers, sometimes we survive on hope. You know, we barely survive on paychecks, you know. I'm not going to lie, though. It's nice to get paid right now to <laughs> teach. <laughs> but we, um, you survive on hope, you know. You're never sure. You never don't know. But you need to remain hopeful. It's like the biggest thing. And there are actual research, you know, if you've ever seen the documentary Unnatural Causes, um, hope has been proven to help people survive, to help people persevere, and it's something that is definitely important to focus on. So for me, while I was here, in order to finish the program and, and get to where I'm at now, I had to remain hopeful, extremely hopeful. And also tell the times, you know, in which I may not be entirely sure if I'm doing the right thing, I think of what um, my professor, Jeff McIndrider, once told me in that it doesn't take much to teach. All you need is a group of kids and some heart. So, you know, I don't think I'm the best teacher. I do everything I can. I'm still mastering my craft, you know? I really believe teaching is an art form. Like, it's like listening to a sick song on the radio. When you see a great teacher, I don't think I'm there, you know? I'm like the remix right now. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, but I really believe that, you know, it's, it's, you gotta keep it going. Um, you know, both these folks also came from UCLA. Um, but yeah, it's really important. So, next up, I'd like to share with you my own hope. How I've been holding on to hope. Um, so, this, these are my students, my high school students, at Edison High School. It's really cool, this is the high school I graduated from. Um, it was going to be closed by No Child Left Behind. It's recognized as a dropout factory. When I was a freshman, um, 850 has started. 850 students started, only 360 finished and walked across the stage. So um, very few of my friends have went to college. Um, most of them either stayed in the city, they fled as soon as they were able to. They just bounced and they're in other cities where you know, they're doing other things. They just, did, they just wanted to do away with everything they experienced. But these are my students right here at Edison High School. Um, it's a Filipino American Studies program, an ethnic studies program. So I am fortunate to be able to teach with them once a week. I'm actually unfortunately missing today with them, but um, I'm in, they're in the hands of extremely other capable teachers. They're also getting pencils, maybe shirts, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure if my direct deposit happened today, but we'll figure that out. Uh, but, yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, <laughs> both discount, okay. So, uh, so I get to work with them once a week. I am mentoring them. Uh, they're all applying to college. And um, we're working on personal statements right now. We're working to get fundings, even donating our own fundings as a teacher to get them to go to different schools, to experience different things. Um, one amazing thing about this school and the other school I teach at, none of the teachers, or one or two, are not from their community, not from their city. They come in from Sacramento, from parts of the Bay Area, from Turlock, other parts of the San Joaquin County and Central Valley. Um, so this is detachment of teachers who come there, and then once the bell rings, peace, I'm out. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have the privilege of teaching them. This is us right now, we're doing this project called The River of Life, in which we discuss our narratives, counter-narratives. Um, this is them seeing what we were doing last year, and how we can improve our different activities and events, and also um, some other projects we're doing. So I'm with them once a week, full-time, every day, these are my fourth grade, I refer to them as my fourth grade warrior scholars. These are, wow, these kids, I love these students. I lose my voice every day with them, and they cause me to lose a lot of weight, which is a good thing, yes, I don't know, but I love them. They're, they're really, you know, to be with them every day, it's, it's, it's an amazing experience to be able to be with them and to really, one cool thing, you know, I, I, I will say about elementary, now that I'm doing elementary as opposed to secondary, that I can see them every day. In their room, we refer to our classroom as our home. So we don't disrespect our home, we do not disrespect each other in our home. We are a community in this class, it's, it is theirs. Um, I'll share with you some pictures of things we've been doing. This is them on the first day of school. This straight line does not happen anymore, I don't know what happened. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what's going on with that. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. Uh, that's Arissa and Javier and Renee, uh, some of my students. 
And this is them putting together their warrior scholars wall, in which basically this wall, this whole side, is their own wall. They get to bring pictures from home, work they've done in class, anything they want. And it's really cool, you know, like, um, as much as it's a different challenge, because now I prepare, prepare for all the different subjects, um, but the fact that I get to be with them and really get to just get to know them, get to know their narratives. You know, an amazing thing about being back home is I found out some of their siblings and even parents um, or folks I grew up with. So there's definitely this, this newfound, um, you know, personal thing, connection with the students. And things I have experienced, they're going through it. And the cool thing is, other than myself and one other teacher at the school, um, who's like a person I grew up with, all the other teachers, they all commute from outside. So when um, I was threatening them, and that if they wouldn't focus, I would go you know, visit their houses, meet up with their parents. <laughs> like, where do I live, Mr. Sabak? Well, according to my phone and GPS, Siri is telling me, you live right here, I live around the corner, I can just walk there. I'm gonna drive hours away. <laughs> so, you know, I'm waiting for the day when I finally get to do that. I'm just gonna roll over with like a sandwich and see what they're doing. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so this is a, a, a list of rules. It is uh, definitely influenced by uh, Jeff Figueroa's Definite Dozen, and also stuff from Patrick Mangian, my mentor Dylan Delvo, um, and the United Players in San Francisco. And I don't want to go over the whole thing, but this is what we're going over. Um, so for fourth grade students to go over this is a lot to ask. So we slowly deconstruct this, but to give you an example of what we've been focusing on, um, number one, show up, physically and mentally. One cannot change his or herself, his or her community, or the world without being present. So straight up, I tell my students, look, Javier, Arissa, Renee, you can be here, but you can not be here at the same time. You get that? So you, when you're present, when you come to class, you're not just here, your body's not just here, your mind is here, you are focused, you are hungry, and you're ready to learn. You're waiting for me to serve you, and we serve each other, and you're all just engaging in this pedagogical feast. I'm gonna go eat lunch after this. Um, <laughs> and another one is that it takes the community to save the community. Community members do not run away from community problems. Community members stand in solidarity and never give up. And I, uh, um, when my students get in trouble, you know, I don't do individual disciplines. Rarely will I do that. In fact, we have a student of the month thing. I don't, I don't know how I feel entirely about that. My, my, um, my rule is that if one of us makes a mistake, we're all making a mistake. Therefore, we will all pay for it. So there's one day I took away the recess, they're really sad. They're really sad. <laughs> well, they're good now, they're good now. They're getting pencils tomorrow. Um, so, and basically that, you know, I want them to know this. I want them to know that this is your city. If something happens, you are also involved and also responsible. So we had this discussion about, let's say somebody shoots somebody for a loaf of bread. You know, I'm trying to put this in a, in a context they can grasp. Um, whose fault is it? Entirely, is the person who shot the person for bread so he or she could eat? Or is it everybody else? So we discussed, went back and forth. Well, well Mr. Savak, obviously the person who shot the person. And I was like, you can see that. But I also think, of, think about this, my students, that you know there are all these other people who had plenty of bread to give to that person. And because they didn't share, one of them got hurt because that person was just trying to survive, was just trying to eat. So when we put in those contexts, they're slowly trying to grasp these humongous terms. And that's when I tell them that we're a community in here. If one of us is not doing well, the others need to support him or her. So I really push this for them, and it's something, like one of my biggest expectations. You know, other teachers have came up to me and say, why is everyone in trouble, or blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, they may all be in trouble, but at least when they rise, they'll all be together. They stand in solidarity. They are community. And that is what I want them to get from my class. And I put, leave every space better than when you came. Leave this world better than when you came. And so my mentor, Dylan Devil, would tell me, um, I was a high, as a high school student, um, he was a person who mentored me, pushed me to go to San Francisco State. At the time, that was the only college I got into. Um, I wasn't going to go to college. I was going to consider community college, doing other routes. But 
He would tell me that in order to leave this world better than when you came, you need to go to school. So this rule applies in different ways in our class. Our classroom is never trashy. When I say leave this world better than when you came, if this classroom was clean when you came in, you either leave it the same way or even better. Um, so we clean up the floors. We don't worry about a janitor or custodian coming in. If we made a mess, we take care of this ourselves. And it's something I tell them that you also need to take this outside of the class. So um, next I'd like to share you what we're doing with this. I'm getting my students to slowly memorize this. Um, it's hard, but you know they're actually pulling through. These are my students in class.